Uh, this is a video on managing self. I wrote a huge book on managing self uh, three years ago and um, uh, got exhausted in the process of putting it together. It was a 10 year project and it got written in about six months. I think it's about 2,700 pages, maybe 3,000 pages. Um, it's not fluffy pages either. It's very well organized, extreme, extremely well organized pages. Um, and this is a course I teach on managing self, actually 15 courses on different aspects using different parts of that book. And this is a summary of them. But it makes an interesting, just looking at the 15 courses as topics, makes an interesting view on self compared to what's out there today in other places. Managing self, there are eight facets of managing self. And they start with um, what selves have to handle in our world today the environment that you build yourself in today. Uh, managing differences at the individual level of life. Differences from past years to present and future years and differences between you and others. Managing differences at the group level. That is, being in a group of people different than you. What do you do with their differences when you're in a group with them? And then six different ways of life. The religion way, the love way, the Zen way, the therapy way, the existentialism way, and the science way. Um, then there are uh, the stories that we tell, which really explain to us who we are and who others are. Uh, the uh, evolution of religion into science in the history of humankind and in individual minds of people as they age. The toolkit for developing selves, which is redefining the parameters, redefining education and adulthood, managing ourself as a culture, and then achieving multi-level fractal self-change. And then finally, kinds of selfhood, kinds of group selfhood, uh, kinds of influencing, influencing others, kinds of happy selves, and kinds of creative selves. Number two, science as our new religion, that is, science is where we get all. Uh, and this is simply those old stories and books about a turtle breathing on the water and all that stuff. That doesn't give us all. Those are jokes. Those stories in those old books make us laugh. Uh, God sneezes or has a poo, and then the, each piece of poo becomes an island. We don't get off from those stories. We laugh. Those are funny stories. Uh, so science is where we get awe delivered to our lives. And so science is at the core of all current religiosity, if you call these experiences of awe religiosity. Regularly, science delivers awe to us. Uh, that is, science tells us our place in the world. Not these old stories about a giant turtle, turtle having poos, and each poo turns into an island, sacred island. Uh, so science is our new religion in actuality in our lives, whether we like it or not. Number three, selves are cultures, and both a, a self is a high performance and a culture is a high performance. But they're arbitrary collections of routines, and so there's nothing particularly good about a self or good about a uh, culture. They're just arbitrary high performances. Routines we've practiced until they're automatic and effortless, and somewhat integrated with other routines that were practiced with them. Um, number three, four. There are degrees and kinds of selfness. People who've had brain accidents, like falling from the sky in a glider, talk about a two-year process of gradually getting routines inside of them back online until two years later after the accident they feel fully themselves. Uh, people in certain drug stupors at hospitals after operations report the same thing, that a week or two or a month or two later they feel fully back online. So there are degrees of self. So our sense of self comes from the interacting of a number of brain modules, a hundred or so. Five, man managing differences in self and other. The big problem in being a self is the conflict between our desire to stand out 
and their desire to fit in. And we want 100% of both. We want to be totally loved and accepted by everybody while being totally different than them. And, of course, they're going to hate us if we're different and we're not going to fit in. And so it, this dual drives in us to fit in and stand out, create endless dramas. That's why we have literature. Six, the self-making process and its stages. Now, the interesting thing is ancient religions, modern therapies, and the practice routines of the modern performing arts all have exactly the same self-development process at their core. And uh, I've talked about it elsewhere. Number six, influencing selves, careers, and team selves. When you realize that every culture is a self, and therefore you have to apologize to cultures, you have to respect cultures, you have to uh, uh, flatter cultures, uh, treat them like persons. Uh, so the Americans stupidly deal with the Palestinian-Israeli conflict as a matter of bribes. Uh, give you a nuclear plant and give you a, a cereal plant and uh, we'll invest money and then you can uh, not kill each other. Uh, and these two cultures want apologies and respect and dignity from each other as selves. And so the Americans, uh, by uh, saying that cultures are not selves, and the cultures are just uh, individuals lusting after refrigerators, <laughs> manage to do nothing. Uh, creating creative selves. You know, we all create a self, but it's actually a lie. We take credit for ourselves, but it was created by teachers and parents from zero to 20 years old while we grew up. And we end up 20 years old in college discovering that we don't like much of the self that we got for free by growing up, and it doesn't work very well, and we need to change parts of it, but most of us don't bother changing them. And so most of us never become an adult in their life. If you work hard for 30 years, you can undo all those routines put into you from 0 to 20, and so by age 55, you can become an adult. Making and changing selves. Making a self is simply a matter of choosing routines and practicing them with others until they are automatic and effortlessly shared with others. Any routines will do. And therefore, what a self is, is constantly evolving as its new configurations of brain modules in new ways, but based on routines newly shared with new kinds of others. Uh, managing emotions and anxieties of being alive. Uh, Self-esteem and... Uh, Self-promotion are the diseases of Americans. It, it, it turns them all into fools. The first two minutes you meet them, Americans are standing around in front of you to your very, very face, telling you how great they are. And, of course, if they were really great people, they wouldn't need to tell you to your face. And they wouldn't need to repeat it all the time to everyone they meet. So I don't know who they're trying to convince, but it has the opposite effect. It's like advertising. The airplane that's dirty has ads about how clean it is. The airplane that's late as ads about how on time they are, and Americans who are telling you how important must be company workers who are not very important at all. Uh, and so uh, the American way of managing self-anxieties of existence uh, by pretending that you are the center of the universe verbally and telling everybody you are in a kind of giant, lifelong verbal advertising campaign, that becomes a joke. So how do real people, uh, much better quality than Americans, deal with the anxieties of existence? 78 Capabilities of Emotional Intelligence. Now, this is where you go through the entire literature, and you look at high performers at handling the relational, social, emotional parts of life, and what capabilities they have that the low performers lack. Where is our self? Mind extensions. It turns out that most of our self is not in our brain, and that schools are very busy educating the parts of us that don't make us intelligence, namely our brain, and in never educating the parts that do make us intelligent, the extensions outside our brain, the various tools which make us able to do what brains cannot do. Our extended minds, it's called. 180 flaws in thought. Kahneman and Tversky, uh, Tversky died, so Kahneman won a Nobel Prize for showing that we are not rational utility seekers, as stupid economics professors constantly assume. And so he destroyed the foundations of economics, and uh, the economists ignored him, therefore, 
but uh, fundamentally, I mean, the one or two economists that still have a brain left understand that the uh, single equilibrium that topology and Robert Canero got Nobel Prizes for uh, doesn't exist, actually, and that we actually have economies of hundreds of multiple equilibrium points and no scientific way of finding out which one the economy will settle in at any given time or set of circumstances which 2008 demonstrated to the tune of losing $13 trillion. So there are 180 flaws in thought, although Kahneman and Sersky presented about 11 of them in their book. Um, there are 180 of them if you go to all the research on brain modules. Um, and our brains betray us in 180 ways. And if you want to be smarter than your competition, then you have to practice routines for compensating for these 180 flaws in thought. Now, I don't suggest doing all 180 at once, but I do suggest finding which of the 180 actually are going to have impacts on your performance and your situation, and then practicing routines to counter those. Selves as story types and educate yourself. Now, it turns out there's a limited number of kinds of stories. Uh, according to Joseph Campbell, there's one story that all stories are slices of. Uh, and then there's people who've got eight stories and another who's got 12. And I decided to just take them all and put them into a model of 64 story types. And um, each story type is a, a self, an explanation of a self. Why are you you? And you tell the story of your life. So there are 64 kinds of self if you have 64. Now, that number is arbitrary. We could do 128 or 16. I like the number 64, so I choose the number 64. It has the right middle level of granularity, enough variety to surprise us, and enough uniformity we can all identify with. Origins, function, and practices of religion. Now, there's an extremely great amount of value in most religious practices. Um, not all religious practices. You know, stoning people to death because some old book told you to is just uh, ignorant murder. Um, and, you know, ignorant religions by gods who didn't attend high school are constantly urging people to kill people because those gods didn't go to high school and they have a lot of hormones. Those kind of gods tend to have a lot of male hormones. And so that killing people is fun for them. Uh, but gods who've been to high school or who have a general equivalence diploma from a equivalence to a high school, uh, gods who are educated at the high school level no longer like killing and no longer uh, ask their adherents to kill. And actually those guys are educated enough to have enough strength that they don't need a whole bunch of humans going around supporting them with killing because the god themselves has enough power they can do things on their own. So the origins and practices of religion, most practices like prayer and worship and uh, confession, stuff like that, uh, those practices have a great deal of contemporary value. But the belief systems that those practices are contexted by tend to be uneducated and uh, a set of male hormone violence things. And so we have to s subtract the practices from the beliefs in order to get value that everybody can use. And I think people cling to religion because they really understand the practices have value. And the communities of congregational religions have a lot of value. And so they don't want to lose that congregational value. And they don't want to lose the value of prayer and those practices. because Just because the beliefs are anti-female, anti-education, anti-decent, and pro-murder. Uh, and so it puts people in a conundrum. Because the belief systems are ridiculous or evil. and But the practices have a lot of value. And the fact of the matter is we all have work to do. Which is abstract, abst extracting the good stuff from the junk. But that's no different than any other part of life or society. Managing happiness and seeking, uh, manage the happiness of seeking and the happiness of arrival. Uh, we have two different happiness systems in the brain. We actually have probably have more than that. But we have two that are well known by research. And they uh, conflict because we have a rival happiness system, which is things like sex, good conversation, uh, good uh, food and drink, uh, no environmental noise, and... Uh, Constant striving to do better and more. And that's where the problem is because the constant striving makes us lose the sex, the good food, the uh, environmental quiet, and uh, good conversation and companionship and uh, to, for the sake of striving. And so inside the arrival happiness system is one element which constantly causes us to lose all the other elements. And so having all of them, you know, if you have just the arrival happinesses without striving, you end up a fat, lazy, boring turd. And uh, if you add the striving, you end up unhappy all the time because you're leaving the other 
arrival happiness isn't because of the striving. Happiness is power and fascination. And so it, this is why we have literature and drama and trouble in life, because balancing these two is, is tricky. And the Zazen and things like that are, are uh, the baby way out because they simply say, ignore half of that, your happiness, the striving part, and say no to it and you'll be happy. That's not going to work. It doesn't work. And so you got to have both. And Zazen and those guys, those old religions, didn't know about brain modules. And so they just, they just said, these are the best brain modules. Do them and ignore the other brain modules. They're evil. <laughs> That was really a cool idea 2,000 years ago. It's a really stupid idea today, and it makes for a lot of unhappy killers. And, uh, and uh, well, killers should be unhappy. Uh, and so, therefore, we need something better than that.